Welcome to the COPD Foundation podcast. We bring you insights from leading health professionals, inspiring stories from those living with lung conditions, practical advice, and the latest in lung health research. Be sure to subscribe, follow us on social media, and visit copdfoundation.org. Take action today, breathe better tomorrow. Just a quick note before we jump into our topic. This podcast series was created for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for formal medical advice. Talk to your healthcare provider if you have any questions. Hello and welcome to the COPD Foundation podcast. I'm Stephanie Williams, a respiratory therapist and educator at the COPD Foundation. And I'm Amanda Atkinson, a registered nurse, and I'm also an educator at the COPD Foundation. Hi, Amanda. It's so good to be with you today. I always feel like we have so much to talk about, and you know what? Today is no exception. (laughs) Our goal today, though, is to discuss the overlap of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, bronchiectasis, and NTM lung disease. So if you need a little bit of a refresher about any of those, we have another podcast episode that discusses them in detail. We could honestly spend hours talking about this, but I think we're going to try to do our best to keep it reined in, right, Amanda? Well, we'll do our best. And for this topic, we have some experts joining us today. The first person I'd like you to meet is Dr. Sandy Sandhouse. Dr. Sandhouse, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dr. Sandy Sandhouse. I am a pulmonologist uh, based in Denver at uh, National Jewish Health, where I've uh, run the Alpha One Clinic uh, for the past uh, 40 years or so, Um, uh, specializing only in Alpha One antitrypsin deficient patients. I also am the medical director of the Alpha One Foundation and AlphaNet, a not-for-profit disease management organization, both based in uh, Carl Gables, Florida. Thank you for being here. We always appreciate your expertise. I've, you know, I've been at the COPD Foundation for a long time, and I've worked for many years before that as a respiratory therapist. And I know that there are, you know, about one in ten people that have Alpha One are diagnosed. So. Um, One thing I've noticed that for those who do have a diagnosis, it seems like it took a long time for them to get a correct diagnosis. That's exactly right, Stephanie. We hear that from our patient community all the time. And it may be because people think of these as rare diseases. So it often takes years for someone to get a diagnosis with alpha-1 or bronchiectasis. Yeah, and that's a big deal because someone may present having symptoms consistent with COPD, but knowing if they have alpha-1 deficiency or bronchiectasis changes their treatment plan. You know, and similarly, diagnosing NTM lung disease can be prolonged for most people. Patients may undergo multiple rounds of antibiotics for presumed bacterial bronchitis or pneumonia before NTM is identified with sputum cultures or bronchoscopy. And this very delay can lead to significant lung damage by the time the diagnosis is made. So, Dr. Sandhouse, are there any particular recommendations for testing that we can, so we can help eliminate this delay? I mean, first of all, it's important to note that most uh, medical societies that put out uh, guidelines regarding diagnosis of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency um, recommend that every patient with a diagnosis of COPD should be tested once in their life for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, because it's a genetic condition, you only need to test once to find out if someone has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Unfortunately, um, most um, physicians don't follow these guidelines, um, and they often don't uh, test for alpha-1 until someone gets a chest X-ray or a CT scan or a pulmonary function test that uh, suggests uh, lung disease with low diffusing capacity and, and obstruction out of proportion to their smoking history or their age and things like that. And so a select number of people get tested for alpha-1. But the data shows that about 1% of all COPD patients have undetected alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So that's a huge number of patients that are not detected. These delays highlight the need for increased awareness and a high index of suspicion among healthcare providers. Prompt referral to specialists, appropriate use of diagnostic imaging, and timely microbiological testing are really crucial in improving patient outcomes. In fact, I'd like to introduce two of our patients who have been kind enough to share um, their experiences with us. The first one I'd like you to meet is Marilyn. She's here with us from Atlanta. 
Thank you so much, Marilyn, for being here. Can you introduce yourself? I am Marilyn from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm just thankful despite um, bronchitis, MTM, and Alpha-1 that I have a fairly normal life as a former third grade teacher. I might add that I've been a wife for almost 60 years. I have three grown sons and seven grandchildren. Hi, Marilyn. I would love to know more about your journey with your lung conditions. Can you tell us when you first recognized you had breathing issues? Okay, all my life, I was kind of sickly. Not really, but it seemed like my colds were worse than everybody else's. I didn't seem to have the other as much energy as other children. Um, I had pneumonia at a very early age of 10. Um, but I walked along, and then um, 21 years ago, I, I was under the care of an internist, and I kept asking him if um, he would send me to a pulmonologist because I knew I was sick. So finally, I got a pulmonologist, and within two appointments, he had diagnosed me with bronchiectasis. And I was so grateful that we had a diagnosis. At the same time, I just wish he had known, and remember it's been 21 years, I wish he had known to check me for Alpha-1 and get me started on um, airway clearance, which has made a big difference in my life. Uh, Ten years after that, I was um, diagnosed with MAC. With that, my infectious disease doctor and my pulmonologist sent me to National Jewish. While I was at National Jewish uh, for two weeks and had that battery of tests, one of the tests was Alpha-1. Um, I got a positive diagnosis. And that was almost wonderful because here I was, 75 years old, and for the first time realizing what why I had not felt as good as other people all my life. Marilyn, I'm sure it was such a relief to finally have some answers. I'm so glad you're on, you're on the right track now. So for those who are unfamiliar, Mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC, is a common type of NTM lung infection. And the diagnostics um, delay can be really long. So MAC infections usually present with nonspecific symptoms, such as chronic cough, fatigue, and weight loss, which are usually mistaken for other conditions. So it can take multiple visits to healthcare providers and extensive testing before a diagnosis is confirmed. Our next guest is Laura from South Carolina. Thank you for being here today, Laura. Um, like Marilyn, you've also gone to National Jewish, where you received a diagnosis of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. But I think your experience is a little bit different than Marilyn's. Can you tell us a little bit about how you were diagnosed? I was diagnosed with um, uh, bronchiectasis and NTM um, in 2006. It was through a random chest x-ray when I was having uh, my annual physical. Um, at the time, they thought it could be, they didn't know, they just saw nodules on my lungs. And after multiple testing, CT scans, and a bronchoscopy, I was then diagnosed with bronchiectasis and NTM infections. Dr. Sandhouse, we've heard um, from Marilyn and Laura that they're both experiencing this overlap that we're highlighting today. And they've talked about how testing made a big difference in their lives. How common is it for people with bronchiectasis to also have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency? That's, that's a difficult question to answer. I can answer it in the opposite direction and say that um, patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency uh, have a very high incidence of bronchiectasis. In one study done in the UK, as many as 94% of patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency have bronchiectasis. So going back to Laura's experience, um, we see that it was a routine chest x-ray that prompted more investigation. Um, Dr. Sandhouse, what are some examples of what a practitioner might notice or could look for that would indicate the need for testing? The diagnosis of bronchiectasis is usually an incidental finding on a CT scan, for instance, um, unless someone is searching for it because someone has a chronic cough that looks infected, that ha where the cough occurs every day, um, and there's evidence of waxing and waning infections and 
evidence of of, of uh, ongoing pulmonary problems, uh, that would often prompt a physician to look for bronchiectasis and a patient to think about whether they have bronchiectasis and ask their patients to they ask their physician to test them. And Laura, let's look at it from you know a patient ex- um, perspective. Based on your experience, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Well, for a primary care doctor, I would say, um, you know, if you have a patient that has persistent coughing, fatigue, and night sweats, is to um, would probably be to pass them along to a pulmonologist and let them handle the care of that patient. And if I were a pulmonologist and I had an NTM bronchiectasis patients, um, I would immediately test them for alpha-1, um, cystic fibrosis, and immune deficiencies, and anything that could be the underlying cause for the bronchiectasis and NTM. Laura, you're so right. I think it's important to remember that the overlap among these conditions is clinically significant. For instance, patients with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency are predisposed to developing bronchiectasis due to the lack of protective protein in the lungs. The structural lung damage and the mucus accumulation in bronchiectasis provide an ideal environment for NTM to establish infection. Yeah, Stephanie, and diagnosing these conditions can be really tricky because their symptoms often overlap. So chronic cough, sputum production, and recurrent respiratory infections are really common in all three of those conditions. Therefore, it's crucial for healthcare professionals to consider a comprehensive differential diagnosis when evaluating patients that are presenting with persistent respiratory symptoms. Laura is a perfect example of the benefits of how routine screenings can really aid in early diagnosis. That's a good point, Amanda. Dr. Sandhouse, do you have any comments about early diagnosis? So the it is true that the earlier you diagnose alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and educate patients about that condition, the more likely it is that um, those patients will prevent the destruction of the lung and identify er- liver disease early if they get it um, and lead a much uh, longer life. In fact, the life expectancy of alpha-1 patients who are diagnosed early is essentially normal. We have people who were diagnosed early, especially by doing family testing, where you identify a patient at ri- uh, uh, with alpha-1, you also identify a family at risk since it's a hereditary genetic condition. Uh, One of my best friend's son, who happened to be a doctor at St. Jude's in Memphis, got sick. He had alpha-1, but he didn't know he had alpha-1. They tried to do a liver transplant, and they couldn't do it soon enough. And he died at age 44. And so I'm very interested in that. And it if he had had the education, if somebody had caught that, he would be living and serving us today as a doctor. I am so sorry about your friend's son. This is exactly why we're talking about this topic today. We did a podcast episode a while back that specifically focuses on genetic testing, discussing it in greater detail with Sydney Radowski, a genetic counselor. So if you're interested in learning more about that, this podcast can be found on the COPD Foundation website. Yeah, Marilyn, this is exactly why we wanted to talk about this and why we want to get the word out about the overlap and the importance of early testing and diagnosis. I was with that pulmonologist for 10 years until he got a diagnosis from MAC. And with that, he sent me to an infectious disease doctor who immediately said, you need to go to National Jewish Well, you know about National Jewish, it is so good. It takes a while to get in there. So there was nothing to do for six months until I could actually get there. So when I got there, then things started moving pretty quickly. I think that many of our patient listeners may identify with the experience of having to wait to see a specialist. I know that I can. Even though it may be hard for our patients to wait, multidisciplinary care is really very necessary pulmonologists, infectious disease specialists, genetic counselors, and respiratory therapists working together help create better patient outcomes and really provide more comprehensive care. That's right. And for many years, the COPD Foundation, we've really been focusing on patient-centered care. 
we have found that that multidisciplinary approach really has benefited our community. So unfortunately, we're coming to the end of our time together today, and we've talked a lot about the need for testing, but can we talk about options that may be available? Um, there are many ways to test for it. Your local lab could do an alpha one hit trypsin level uh, for a very inexpensive uh, price. Uh, it should always be followed up with a genotyping uh, to actually document what the um, genes are that the person has if the alpha one levels are low. Unfortunately, we now um, know of hundreds of mutations of the alpha one gene, and there are several mutations that have been identified that give you normal alpha-1 levels of a protein that doesn't work. They're somewhat rare compared to the usual Z and S, which are the two most common abnormal alpha-1 genotypes, um, and require genotyping to find them. The good news is there's a lot of ways to get free genotyping. Um, some of the companies that make augmentation therapy provide kits that are either buckle swabs or um, finger stick blood tests that can be sent mailed in and the results returned to the physician. Um, the Alpha One Foundation has a free test kit program where the results go to the right to the patient. They can do the test at home and get the results sent to them and they can decide what to do with that information. There really are a lot of ways to be tested. And I think people will be relieved to know that it doesn't have to be a blood test. The buckle swab or cheek swab really is a good option. And as a clinician, it's important not only to test, but it's important to keep up with the latest research and guidelines. That's really crucial. So for our listeners, we recommend exploring resources from the American Thoracic Society and the Alpha One Foundation, and there are lots of others. That's a, that's a great point. And, and I, I would point out that the Alpha One Foundation uh, uh, at alphaone.org um, on the on the web has a list of centers of excellence in Alpha One that any physician can turn to. Um, the foundation also uh, pays travel and lodging uh, for someone's first visit to a center of excellence. Um, it, it's a, yes, uh, we have over ninety centers of excellence now around the country, geographically distributed, and they include um, lung specialists liver specialists, and pediatric liver specialists, because one of the things that we didn't talk about um, uh, is that kids can get significant liver disease and require liver transplants as, a, as an infant or child uh, from Alpha One. This has been a really great discussion, Stephanie, and I want to thank our guests for joining us. It's always a pleasure, and I hope our listeners found the discussion really insightful. The interplay between bronchiectasis, NTM lung disease, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is really complex, but understanding it is key to improving patient outcomes. Definitely. And for more information about bronchiectasis, visit our bronchiectasis and non-tuberculous mycobacterium lung disease initiative website at bronchiectasis and ntm360.org. You can also find information regarding Alpha One in the COPD Foundation 101 library on the COPD Foundation website. You can find links to these websites in the podcast description for this episode. Thanks, Stephanie. The COPD Foundation really has a wealth of resources for healthcare providers and also for your patients. So come join us on COPD 360 Social to keep the conversation going. You can also follow us on all major social media channels. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Be on the lookout for more episodes where we delve into other crucial topics in respiratory and infectious diseases. Thank you for tuning in to the COPD Foundation podcast. And remember, whether you're managing a chronic lung condition, providing support to those who are, or just want to learn more about lung health, the COPD Foundation is here to support you. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and follow us on social media. Take action today. Breathe better tomorrow.